Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I have a really interesting case for you guys. Um, it's of a patient who actually attended today, and I'll just give you their case um, history. Um, they've been suffering from a blocked ear, I think for about five years, if I'm not mistaken. And so just before COVID, and um, during the last five years, they've had a couple of failed attempts of ear irrigation. Uh, at their local GP practice. So this patient's from Nottingham. So it, it is a bit of a postcode lottery. Some, most GPs in the UK are no longer offering any form of earwax removal. Some surgeries are still are. Um, so they had a couple of failed attempts there. Um, and then they've also had a couple of failed attempts at some high street hearing companies, um, who I won't mention, um, but who are known to um, train their reception staff to perform earwax removal. Um, so... The last attempt was a few months ago, and um, the patient obviously has been suffering for a while, uh, but they've been just managing, and recently they decided to take matters in their own hands, and they purchased an online, one of these online kind of, I wouldn't even call it an endoscope, but technically, well, it's not an endoscope as um, the traditional sense, because an endoscope should have a, a relay of rod lenses, um, but you could argue anything that goes inside your body, that's uh, a camera, so uh, an endo, hence the, the ins inside and internal cavity can be classified as an endoscope. Anyway, they purchased one of these things that uh, I know are heavily advertised uh, on social media, which has a little correct attachment. Prior to trying to remove it themselves, uh, they had been using some sodium bicarbonate drops and water-based drops which has made their ear really dry and itchy, which is one of the um, side effects of using sodium bicarbonate drops in particular. And they actually just caused a lot more problems for themselves. They've really pushed this in, really impacted it, and they have caused some trauma to the front section of the ear canal. It's a bit bruised, a bit, um, a bit swollen. So it's quite a tricky plug of wax and keratin to remove. You can see it's got this peripheral layer uh, silvery whitish layer so at this stage I'm wondering is it a, a keratosis obturans but I can't really see any um, with a keratosis obturans you've, it's it's formed of um, desquamous skin cells so the outer layer of skin on the ear can is actually dead it's it's lost it's, it's lost its metabolic uh, function it has got no nucleus no organelles it's just full of keratin and um some little um, particles, uh, uh, granules, if you like, called natural moisturising factors, so some amino acids, um, uralic acid, uh, carbolic acid. So these are, uh, these are hydrophilic molecules, so they just absorb enough moisture from the environment to keep the dead layer of skin hydrated. Because, of course, this outer layer of skin is visible um, to other people, so we want it to look healthy and so it helps to moisturise it. So, um, the keratosis obturans is formed of dead skin, which is the outer layer of skin, uh, the stratum corneum, which is the, the outermost layer of the epidermis, but dead skin that is shed, and that's what's called desquamous. So, uh, these skin cells, they have got the Latin name of um, squame, and a squame is uh, literally translated as a, a fish scale. Uh, desquamous is when you're descaling a fish um, that's the the that's the, uh, the the definition so with keratosis obturans it's the dead skin the outermost layer of skin but it's shed it's it's left the surface of the ear canal and with keratosis obturans also these skin cells they've not fully disconnected from one another they're still interlocked so it has a lamella structure so like a thin sheet or layers of thin sheet um, and in between that you've got lipids um, so it hasn't really got that um, texture about it but it's not to say it's not a keratosis obturans but the giveaway is if you keep on watching guys and you probably can tell by the, the title of the video this patient has got a, 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 an external auditory canal cholesterol which is quite rare and with a canal cholesterol they're not it's not it's a skin cyst it normally uh, the most common form is a middle ear cholesterol um, but this one it's an external auditory canal one and they're made up of squamous epithelial tissue so the outer layer of skin the dead skin um that's um on the 
surface of the ear canal, but this skin is, hasn't shed it. It's still attached to the canal wall itself. Um, so what can happen is in the canal itself, um, these skin cells should migrate sideways laterally from the center of the eardrum. These epithelial skin cells move sideways at a rate of around 0.05 millimeters a day, or maybe 0.1 millimeters a day. So it averages at about 1.5 to 3 uh, millimeters a month. That's probably a better way of um, kind of almost um, kind of appreciating the rate. So it's the same rate as your fingernail growth. Um, and as this, this um, outer layer of skin, the epidermis layer, this, and more specifically the stratum corneum, which is the most outer layer, because this stratum corneum has four separate layers, um, as it approaches the entrance, it then begins to shed. Now, with a canal cleschotoma, what happens is this skin is not able to migrate. It, uh, it's trapped somehow. And so then layers of skin behind it that's trying to shed obviously builds up against the obstructed part of the ear canal where the skin has first uh, failed to stop migrating. And why does um, skin stop migrating? Well, it could be uh, several reasons. It could be um, sometimes patients who have uh, radiotherapy um, around the ear or the parotid gland. Um, it can damage the, the the vascular supply to the ear and the vascular supply to the ear, so the blood supply to the ear canal, is what fuels the migration of skin. So in the absence or reduced arterial supply to the canal wall, these skin cells are not able to um, migrate sideways out to the ear as well. Of course, if you, um, uh, the individual themselves, if you poke and prod in the ear and you cause an abrasion and then some inflammation, that inflammation can act as a barrier so the skin can't migrate past it. Um, some people have uh, anatomical defects in the ear, so they might have uh, bumps and um, um, uh, troughs and uh, potholes present in the ear canal, which can um, slow down the rate of migration. Um, so there's, there, there is several reasons. Um, sometimes excessive inflammation in the ear can also cause that, because when you've got excessive inflammation, you just have a a high turnover of dead skin and the skin is just not quick enough to migrate it's just there's too much skin um it's so basically the ear is producing skin at a quicker rate than it can naturally migrate and shed it so you get a natural buildup. now when this skin starts uh, it it's stopped in its tracks it can form into a cyst and when it forms into a cyst then um, you've got what we call a basal layer of this epidermal layer of skin, the outer layer of skin. So at the base of that outer layer of skin, you've got this stratum basal layer. It's made up of stem cells. And in this layer, the skin cells um, keep reproducing. So you're getting this constant uh, reproducing of skin. So this cyst just gets bigger and bigger uh, because it's forever growing. It, um, Unlike a Curtis Azobtrans, with a Curtis Azobtrans, the skin itself, it's, it's not going to reproduce because it's the, it's the shed layer of skin. And once the skin is shed, it's not got access to the stratum um, basal layer, so it can't reproduce um, metabolically anyway. Uh, you can have other layers of dead skin uh, piling on, but you're not going to have uh, replication of uh, and formation of new skin cells like you would have if you've got this basal layer of the stratum corneum. So this cyst just gets bigger and bigger. And when it gets bigger and bigger, these individual um, skin cells, they are kind of compressed against one another. And then it can damage the, the membranes of these skin cells, which then release um, uh, what we call lysosomal enzymes. So these enzymes are normally within um, the, the, the cell body of the skin cells. Now, these lysosomal proteolytic enzymes, they basically are digestive enzymes. They, they digest uh, and break down proteins. So obviously the skin is made, made up of protein, um, bone, anything in, it, in its path, it can start to destruct it. Um, also, the shedding of the skin is quite important because you may have some pathogenic bacteria on this uh, outer layer of skin. And... The shedding of the skin and the lateral movement of the skin almost gets rid of any 
pathogenic bacteria, so it, it prevents it from colonizing. But if the skin can no longer migrate sideways because it's stopped in its tracks for whatever reason, um, some of the reasons I discussed earlier, um, then um, the shedding of the skin, it, it can't come out. So any, the, the shedding still occurs, but it occurs within the cyst. So you get a buildup of keratin matter within the cyst, um, and then you get bacteria that would otherwise have been ejected and evicted from the ear. It's still present within the cyst. And then when the bacteria feed on all the keratin and all the uh, debris, it can extrude discharge. It can itself extrude these um, protolytic enzymes. So the bacteria itself can uh, produce these enzymes that start digesting and breaking down skin and bone. Um, so you can quickly see how it can become a very nasty condition. Um, so what's happened here, and I've just, as I said, you've obviously been watching me remove it. I used the ear pick to good effect. I used the um, forceps. Initially, it was just a bit soft and mushy, though. So the forceps were limited in their benefit. But then I'm now using the right correct, which also really, really helped to remove the last part. So I used the ear pick be initially because there was nothing for me to grab onto that it was so impacted, so it wasn't going to suction away. So I used the tip of the ear pick, which has got a really, really fine diameter. And I managed to kind of get in between the canal wall and this plug of wax and skin. Now, although the ear pick didn't itself um, extract this plug of wax and skin totally from the ear, it, I, I managed to dissect the plug of wax and skin into smaller pieces. And by doing that, I was then able to use the forceps, a bit of suction, and then eventually there was enough space on the posterior canal wall in the back section to curl the correct in and behind and then leverage out the rest. So uh, the main body uh, of this ear canal, uh, the main body of wax and keratin, should I say, has been removed. So you would now say this ear is unoccluded. Uh, if it was occluded, then you wouldn't see the eardrum. So it's unoccluded, so the patient could hear significantly better. Now you can see here, there's some trauma. So this is where the patient's been poking. Um, previously, there was some granulation tissue as well. So granulation tissue is inflammatory tissue. So whenever you see granulation tissue, you know there's been some trauma and some inflammation and the body's going through a healing process. So one of the way the bodies can heal is that um, you can form granulation tissue and it's made up of connective tissue that has its own neurovascular supplies. Essentially, it has its own uh, blood supply, blood capillaries, and it has this very bumpy, red, sometimes moist appearance. Um, it does put the hairs on the back of my neck up whenever I see granulation tissue. And it, it looks like flesh um, and it comes away like it just sometimes you, when you're removing granulation tissue, sometimes you're not even aware because it's embedded within the wax or keratin. It, it, it kind of startles you and you're just done, stops you in your tracks. And, oh, God, what's that? And it's just from the granulation tissue. So at the moment... You know, the patient can hear better, but there's, there's quite an odorous smell originating from the ear now. Of course, it could just be the wax. The wax has been there for a long, 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 long time. And um, naturally, it's going to uh, oxidize and acidify. And you're going to get this very acidic odor coming out. And um, you get humidity and dampness, which can then macerate the skin. And that can just release some foul odors. But it, it, for me, it was more than that. It just felt like there was there's something hidden in this ear. So um, I'm already thinking at this stage, is there a canal cleshiotoma? So, um, so with the canal cleshiotoma, these form in the ear canal itself. You get the syn cyst. Um, they then, the cyst just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and as it does, the centre of it fills up with keratinous debris. So the keratin is the, de is the keratin that fills the outer layer of skin. Um, it then releases these enzymes, uh, protolytic lysosomal enzymes, so do bacteria that feed on this dead skin. And these enzymes begin to basically digest and break away protein to the skin layer underneath, and then eventually the bone. So quite common with a canal cleshiotoma is an ulceration, there's a skin missing, where you won't get that with keratosis obturans, or you shouldn't get that. So there's two key distinctions there already. So with a keratosis obturans, this, this, the, the plug of skin is made up of shed skin, whereas the 
cyst of a canal cleshitoma is not, it's made up of dead skin because the outer lower skin is dead, um, but it also has some metabolic active skin, so the, the inner layers, the, the, out, uh, the inner layer of the epidermis, which is the outer lower skin. So the epidermis, as I said, it's, it's, it's got four layers in the ear and five elsewhere in the body. Um, and the, um, with uh, keratosis obtrans, you shouldn't get an ulceration. You might get the widening of the ear canal due to bony reabsorption. Um, so you, the ear canal is wider, but not because the bone itself is diseased and um, basically digested away as is the case with a canal cleshitoma, because a canal cleshitoma, these enzymes not only ulcerate the skin, they, they damage the, a sheath that lives on the, the bone called the periosteum, so you can get periosteitis, and the periosteum is what nourishes the bone, it supplies it with its nerves and its blood and its oxygen. So when you've got periosteitis, uh, the bone underneath is starved of all the nutrients, uh, oxygen, uh, energy that it needs, and then the bone gets infected and it starts decaying. Um, with keratosis obtrans, the bone doesn't decay, but it's instead it goes through a process of bony reabsorption. So what bony reabsorption is, so with a keratin plug, which makes a keratosis obtrans, because it expands and it puts pressure on the canal wall, um, when it puts pressure against the canal wall, it um, causes a dilation of the blood, uh, blood vessels, capillaries, and that then, the dilation of the blood capillaries, then irritates the um it irritates the periosteum and when it irritates the periosteum it then activates specialized cells that sit on the surface of the bone called osteoclasts and what the osteoclasts do they um recycle if you like they they break down the minerals that form that constitute bone so it's not a disease it's not decaying like the canal cleshitoma the bone but with a canal, uh, with a uh, keratosis obtrans, it's basically breaking down all the minerals um, the osteoclasts are. And these minerals are, are then uh, reabsorbed by the, uh, the bloodstream and transported to other parts of the body where they may be required to uh, form new bones. So there's another specialized cell that sits on the surface of the bone called osteoblasts, and they are responsible for the formation of new new uh, bone. So again, so when you get a widening with keratosis obtrans, it's not because the bone's getting diseased, it's just because it's getting remodeled, re bony reabsorption, the minerals are being broken down, they've been transported elsewhere, and you get this widening. And the widening with a uh, keratosis obtrans is quite global. It's around the whole circumference of the ear canal. Whereas with a canal cleshitoma, typically it's more localized. Uh, so it's a specific part in the ear. It could be multiple sites, um, um, in this case, it's more on the inferior canal wall and anterior. So the, uh, in the case of the left ear, kind of south, uh, west. And at the moment, you're still not seeing it, guys. So uh, you're going to see it at the end. At the moment, I'm just trying to clear all this squamous um, skin. So this skin, as I said, it's not, it's not desquamous. It's not shed skin. It's skin that's on the surface, but uh, you can see it's kind of macerated. Um, so it just needs to be removed and mainly because I want to see what's behind it. I just want to make sure there's no pathology. Um, now, um, so there's quite a, there's a few distinctions there already between a canal cleshitoma and um, a keratosis obtrans. With a keratosis obtrans, the skin should still be intact. It shouldn't be ulcerated. You also don't get, shouldn't really get any otorrhea, any discharge uh, um, with keratosis obtrans. Whereas with a canal cleshitoma, you typically do get otorrhea, and there is some otorrhea at the bottom, and you'll, you'll see that in a moment. Um, so this thickened layer of dead skin that's sitting on the anterior canal wall, it's quite tricky to remove because this patient's ear canal is quite sensitive and tender already. Um, I mean, they've had this plug of wax and skin for, for years. They've been poking around more recently. There's some trauma, there's some bruising on the anterior canal wall we've been working on now. Um, and it's interesting because today, not only have I come across this canal cleshitoma, but I've potentially also come across a, a more typical uh, middle ear cleshitoma. It's, it doesn't seem like a typical middle ear cleshitoma. And I have sent some images to my colleague, an ENT surgeon, and he agrees that 
it doesn't appear to be your traditional inverted commas middle ear kleshotoma, and I'll describe what they are, what one is in a moment. Uh, but it could be, and the reason why I don't think it is, is because it's located with a middle ear kleshotoma. So let me explain what middle ear kleshotoma is. So I've just described to you what a a, a rare canal kleshotoma is. The incident rate, I think, is one in a hundred thousand. I suspect it's probably a lot more, but it can go and diagnose or misdiagnose because quite commonly it may be misdiagnosed for a keratosis subtrans, for example, or another condition called a B9 osteonecrosis. And I'll try and, if I've got time, I'll talk about what that is a bit later on in this video as well. But if you look at my YouTube channel, I have described in depth in previous videos, you can just type in B9 osteonecrosis and you'll get a good definition there. So half the eardrum is visible. There's a bit of keratin on the anterior part. I've tr tried my best to remove now. I got some of it out. So guys, I'm not going to remove a little less flat, uh, last fleck of skin and speck of skin here. Uh, uh, this video is 35 minutes, but all the edited bits where the pet, when I was outside the ear talking to them, patient was here for about 45, 50 minutes, and there's only so much you can do. And I could be here all day removing all this. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my clinic got held behind, which is fine. So I don't want to rush my job, but there's a point where you, you, you've got to say that that's enough of the treatment. Because um, otherwise, yeah, as I said, you could be here all day. Um, I've done a lot more than I thought I would. Um, but still at this moment, um, I'm still looking for this uh, canal kleshotoma. And I kind of know it's going to be uh, more at the bottom, but this is a bit more accessible at the moment. So I just wanted to peel all this away. Um, and then I'm going to target the bottom. So now a middle ear kleshotoma is probably a bit more common um, than, well, not probably, it is a lot more common in respect to a canal kleshotoma. And um, where we are now, the eardrum, to the right hand side, um, that's called the posterior superior quadrant. So essentially you're looking at north east in this patient's ear. That part of the eardrum, um, it's formed of the pars flaccida, which is the top part of the eardrum. So the pars flaccida is a lot more elastic than the main body of the eardrum, pars tensor. Um, and it's got a middle fi fibrous connective tissue layer like the pars tensor, the main body of the eardrum, but the cartilage is not um, as organized. So it, whereas the pars tensor is, and it because the cartilage, uh, sorry, the, the fibrous tissue uh, and connective tissue in the middle layer of the eardrum, because the eardrum is three plies thick, because it's radially arranged, it's almost like a spider's web, so it gives it more strength and tautness. Whereas the pars flaccida, you still got the uh, cartilage, but it's more elastic cartilage and it's not arranged in the same manner. So although the pars flaccida, the top part of the eardrum, is actually thicker, so there's a misconception that the pars flaccida is thinner, it's actually thicker than the main body, but it's more elastic. Um, and also the posterior superior quadrant, which is actually then overlaps with the past tensor as well. Uh, that part of the past tensor, ironically, uh, it's not like the rest of the past tensor, the middle fibrous layer in that region of the eardrum, although it's technically on the past tensor, but it resembles the past flaccida. So that part, part of the eardrum as well. So the top section of the eardrum, the past flaccida and the top right hand side of the corner of the eardrum and slightly east which overlaps with the main body of the eardrum to pass tensor that's also quite uh, flaccid and elastic so these regions of the eardrum are prone to getting sucked inwards uh, or, or should what we say retracted and i'll come back to that in a moment so now we're targeting uh, this bottom part of the ear canal so i've kind of cleared away the side walls and this is probably the more tricky part um it's a bit more sensitive, got some granulation tissue there coming away. And I'm starting to reveal now the ulcerated skin, which is underneath that other skin layer. So sitting on this, top of this before was a blanket of squamous tissue. It's a squamous skin. So skin that was, it's dead skin because it's the surface skin, but it hasn't shed. And underneath that, you've got this ulceration. So it's hidden by this rug of dead skin lining the, the floor of the ear canal. And now that I'm peeling that away, you can see these enzymes are, are busy at work. There's obviously some bacterial involvement there as well, releasing these enzymes. And there's basically holes in, in the base of the ear canal. There's openings, widenings, 
and I'm just trying to get in and get as much keratin out as possible. Um, so you can see this kind of almost greeny, yellowy stuff. So it's keratin, but also probably a bit of otorrhea discharge. So some granulation tissue here. The adjacent skin is quite inflamed. So I'm going to get you guys to continue watching that, and I'll just go back to the middle ear cleshiotoma. Now, a retraction of the eardrum is when the eardrum gets sucked in, and it gets sucked in when the air pressure behind the eardrum is negative in comparison to the air pressure in the atmosphere. So essentially, um, we want the middle ear pressure, so that the air pressure behind the eardrum in the middle ear cleft to be equal to the air pressure in the environment. And when the air pressure is equal, either side of the eardrum, not only is the eardrum in its uh, appropriate anatomical position, it's, it's, it's at its most mobile, uh, it's most responsive. So when the sound waves hit the eardrum, the eardrum vibrates, send these messages, these mechanical waves through the ossicles, the three bones, to the organ of hearing, the cochlea, uh, where eventually they are, um, um, they are transferred into electrochemical responses, which are then sent up the auditory nerve to the brain, where we, uh, so the auditory cortex in the brain, where we process it as sound and interpret it as sound. So um, there's a tube behind the eardrum um, and it's on the front kind of, if you look through the eardrum, sometimes you can see it, it's like a shadow, but it, it will be on the southwest region of the eardrum in this case, on the left side. Um, you've got the eustachian tube, which is an, an orifice that connects the middle ear to the back of the nose, the nasopharynx, and um, the, na the eustachian tube is responsible to equalise the air pressure. It's at resting state, it's shut at the back of the nose uh, and, it, and the throat, and it's shut for a reason. It prevents upper respiratory tract infections traveling up the eustachian tube to infect the middle ear. But it also prevents you from hearing your own um, your own voice, because otherwise your voice, when you speak, it travels up your nose as it does through your ear canal, and it hits the underside of your eardrum via the eustachian tube. So with the eustachian tube being shut, it stops sound waves traveling up your nose, up the eustachian tube, and vibrating the inside of the eardrum, which has the same effect. Um, and it also stops you from hearing your internal respiratory sounds because again these can be these can travel up the eustachian tube and then be heard inside your ears. So that'd be very irritating. So the eustachian tube is normally shut and they open uh, themselves naturally when you swallow, yawn, or chew just momentarily. Uh, so I think it's about four times a minute. I think that's the, probably about the rate it does it. But if that eustachian tube fails to open when it should, then there means there's there's no air traveling up your station tube. So all the residual air that was inside the middle ear cleft, inside the, the cavity behind the eardrum, that gets absorbed um, by the cells in the middle ear, the mucosal cells. Um, and then there's, that means that once it has, once all the remaining air in the middle ear it has been absorbed by the cells in the middle ear, there's no more air, there's a vacuum. And when there's a vacuum effect, your eardrum gets sucked in. And as I, as I described earlier, the, the parts that are going to be most common to getting sucked in is the parts of flaccida. So that's the very top part of the, the eardrum, like probably the, the top 15%. But also in the case in this left ear, it's going to be some of the pars tensor where the, the middle layer of the pars tensor is not as strong and taut as the rest. And instead it resembles more the structure of the pars flaccida where all the middle layer is it's it's more loosely populated um, uh, and more dispersed the, the fibrous tissue there so i'll come back to that in a moment so you can see i've really really cleaned this out quite a lot now the patient was finding this a bit uncomfortable so i've got as much out as i can i think actually that's just a piece of bone probably a bit of keratin around it but you can see we're looking underneath the skin there the skin is somewhat um, uh, sagging and we're looking underneath the skin where the bone is and they could with a canal cleshitomo a grade three so grade one canal cleshitomo is when you've got a uh, hyperplasmia of epithelial skin so that essentially you've got a buildup of dead skin which we saw there that blanket of skin so we, we can refer to that as stage one a hyperplasmia um, of the skin a phase two a grade two is when you've got uh, an ulceration of the skin and underlying um, uh, periosteitis, so an infection of the periosteum. So there is an ulceration there. There's an infection of the periost uh, periosteum. You can see it's inflamed. Uh, there's a bit of discharge there. Um, 
a grade um, three is when you start getting sequestrum. So in the bone, not only does it start to decay, but it separates. And I think there's some sequestrum there. Um, I mean, in the past, there's, there's little been bone fragments there that I've been able to remove in the past videos. Um, and they're not always known to be bone until afterwards you look at it and you think, okay, that, that is not skin, it's not hard in its character, it's actually it's, uh, bone fragments. And a grade four, it's when um, the erosion gets really, really bad and the sequestrum gets bad that it starts to invade adjacent structures. So to the back of the ear canal, you've got the mastoid bone. Uh, to the front, you've got the temporomandular joint. Um, it's very rare for canal to go upwards because typically they're, they're found more um, to the floor of the ear canal and to the front section. But I know there's been documented cases where it has gone upwards and obviously on top of the ears, we've got the, the cranial cavity. So the, the middle cranial fossa is um, what's directly, is, um, you've got, that's the bone that basically separates the, the ear canal to the um, cranial cavity, so basically where our brain sits. Um, sometimes, again, it, it's rare, but they can grow inwards through the eardrum, but generally they're, they're more kind of more lateral in the ear canal. Um, so when your eardrum gets sucked in, in those particular regions, um, it's a hot spot for migrating skin to get trapped. So the skin um, on the eardrum, so all the outer layer of skin, believe it or not, so this epidermis layer of skin that I've just been describing, all of it in the ear canal, it's all produced at the very centre of the eardrum, the umbo region. Um, I call, it looks like the bullseye. And you, you'll see here, that's the hammer bone. To the right-hand side of the suction probe, that's the short process, that's the spherical part. There's a bit of skin there, so it's hard to fully see. And then the bone, because the way I'm holding the endoscope, it's travelling horizontal. And just on top of the suction probe here, just literally on top of it, uh, just where it kind of where the eardrum flexed a bit, that's the umbo, that's the center part of the eardrum. And all the skin cells for the epidermis originates and is produced in the center of the eardrum. And what happens is these skin cells, as they're produced, they radially move outwards. So it's I've described it in the past as in you're standing on top of a pond, you drop a pebble and the pebble causes a ripple effect. So imagine these ripples of skin moving outwards, away from the centre of the eardrum to the outer skirts of the eardrum, and then slowly uh, migrating sideways and lining the surface of the ear canal. So when you've got a retraction pocket, these migrating skin cells, they fall into the pocket and they get trapped in there and it can't escape. And then this migrating skin cells, they form into a cyst, so obviously this, that pocket just gets filled with dead skin, um, and it kind of, you form a cyst, and then the cyst is self-generating because it's forming more and more skin cells, and then you get the release of these enzymes, so it starts being destructive. Um, so that's a middle ear cholesterol type of way, then it grows inwards from the posterior superior part of the ear canal and that can go to the mastoid bone that can go up towards the brain and uh, uh, cause a dehiscence there of the thin plate of bone that separates the the cranial cavity and the ear canal those are the ten, um, tigman tympani uh, can a middle ear cholesterol can um, cause a brain abscess uh, meningitis it can be fatal if left untreated so this patient, going back to what I was describing today, who I also saw, they had this red mass. So it's more like a polyp. It wasn't less of a dead s s uh, skin plug, but I mean, they can uh, a cholesterol can then eventually form into one of these red polyps. But it was more on the anterior part, the front part of the ear canal, uh, the eardrum. Now, of course, it's not to say that that part of the eardrum can't get sucked in and retracted, but my colleague wasn't sure if it was a canal cholesterol, uh, a middle ear cholesterol, but said it's possible. So we've referred anyway, and they're going to have to do more scans to diagnose that. So I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. I hope you find it quite informative. Um, do stay tuned. I've got loads more videos to upload in due course. Take care. Bye.